We've got people online, and we've got people uh, here in the room eating your sandwiches, so that's good there. Uh, if you're online, uh, you can mute your audio, and you can turn off your video until the Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you do have a question, you can use the chat. Uh, people in the room, if it's a quick question, uh, you can uh, pop your hand up, and I'll try and answer it. Otherwise, we'll hold it till the end. The handout for this presentation is out on the club website. Uh, so you can get that, and I believe Jim will add it to the chat in a few minutes to, just to give people time to come in. So let's get started. Our agenda, we'll cover some club status things first, and then we'll get to our main topic. Uh, meeting format, well, for those uh, in, in person here, eat your sub. Uh, you can ask your question if you're in person. Uh, if you're online, hold it till the end, uh, uh, if online. I want to do a big thank you to Paula there for uh, ordering the sandwiches and to Chuck uh, for the water and the cookies there. So thank you very much, Chair. Future meetings. We do have a Max Sig coming up uh, this Friday, April 21st. And the agenda is not set yet, although I think Mike sent something out this morning. Uh, we do have our monthly Q&As. Uh, the next one will be May 2nd. And then our uh, next general meeting will be May 17th. Uh, and we'll uh, try and have the in-person again. We won't have food again. Uh, and we'll see how we're going to handle that. But right now, there's no sign up or, or we haven't uh, started taking it for that yet. Uh, the topic will be setting up a new PC by myself. And we'll talk about what to do uh, on the old PC, things to do to prepare for moving to a new PC, uh, what to do on the new PC, and some general tips and setup on moving the data. Uh, officers, we've got uh, Jim uh, to my left there as our president. Uh, Linda, I don't see Linda here. Uh, Paul is our membership secretary. Paula is our treasurer. Chuck is our recording secretary. Uh, Mike is our MaxSig. Uh, Andrew and back there is our communication coordinator. And I'm a director at large. And hopefully, uh, well, we're still working on a picnic or some, some kind of other gathering there, too. We'll see what happens uh, later this year. Uh, members old and new, you can pay your dues to Paul. Uh, Paul isn't here, but we can take him or get him to Paul there. Uh, but just a reminder, if you are changing emails, make sure and notify us so that we can keep in touch with you. If you do have suggestions for topics, you can email your topics. You can talk to any of the board members. Excuse me, I'm trying to eat in between here. Uh, if you want to volunteer to present on any hardware or software, use at home or work. Or write a short article. We'd uh, love to get you, get you involved there. And we do have our monthly eBytes newsletter. Out on our website, if you miss a meeting or want to revisit a meeting, uh, we publish our meeting slides and handouts, our past meeting recordings. We have a deal section, and we have our monthly uh, newsletter. And the link is also sent in all the emails that we send out. So let's get to our main topic today which is Identity Theft in the Dark Web, by myself, Tom Kreitzer. What do the Minneapolis high schools, T-Mobile, Norton LifeWalk, Uber, LastPass, PayPal, and Twitter all have in common? <laughs> yeah, they've been hacked this year, so far this year. Uh, so these are uh, some, of the, some of the local and... Uh, uh, the Minneapolis schools was on the news, I think, two or three weeks ago or four weeks ago there. But, yeah, they've all been hacked. They've all suffered massive hacks there. After most of these data breaches, the stolen data is made available or sold, in most cases sold, on the dark web. And the reason it's done that way is the person who steals it can make thousands to millions of dollars for the data that they've stolen. So it's a very lucrative business. That's why you have uh, so many hackers and so many people out there trying to break in and steal, uh, steal data there. 
and we'll talk about all this. So this is just some information from 2022 on uh, breaches. There were 4,100 publicly disclosed breaches in 2022. So this isn't even counting the number of servers or people that didn't know that data was stolen from them. 22 billion records were exposed. The most common data that's stolen is 88% uh, of the data stolen is email accounts. 62% is passwords. And then after that, you have names, phone numbers, social security, credit cards, and you name it, any other uh, piece of personal information. So let's put a little definition on what is identity theft. Identity theft is when thieves use someone's personal data to take over or open new accounts for a financial gain. So in some cases, if they have the password or can break into an existing bank account, that's taking over. In other cases, if they have enough information, they can create brand new accounts, new credit cards, new bank accounts, uh, things like that. Personal data is things like names, date of birth, social security number, account IDs, email, bank account, credit card number, PIN numbers, passwords, addresses, phones, and lots of other information. Your personal data is always at risk and usually is stolen long before you even realize that you're a victim. So a number of these... Uh, breaches in that, it's months, if not a year later, that people uh, uh, that own the servers uh, find out that their data actually has been compromised and is now for sale out on the dark web. Okay, so what are the ways that uh, your identity is stolen? Well, the most common is what we talked about, data breaches. Uh, the, so that's something that really you have no control over. You sign up with your bank, you sign up with the state of Minnesota, you uh, sign up on the Minneapolis uh, school system, and there's a data breach. There's nothing that you could do differently to protect yourself. You're at the uh, mercy of whoever you're giving your data to. Uh, the second most popular way that uh, some of this data is stolen is malware and spyware. So that's viruses and uh, things like that. So certainly individually, you can uh, you can uh, have that happen. John, yes. Are you sharing? Because somebody said they cannot see anything, so they can share it. Uh, uh, I mean, I was seeing it. I yeah, I can I see the presentation. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I did, so I, did I did share and share the sound also. Okay, yeah. If, yeah, other than Jim, people are seeing it, yeah. Maybe disconnect and try connecting back yeah. in or? I mean, I hate to disconnect mine no, and no, connect I, back. Because everybody else Everybody else online can see it. So, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, you may try and disconnecting yeah, and go back in. Out. If if not, uh, or if you can't get connected, I will, or I am recording this, and I'll put it out after the meeting. Okay. So malware and spyware is the second most popular way that this data is stolen. There. That's a little. Uh, that's quite a bit less than the data breaches because. The data breach is so much more data is compromised and, and a thief can make so much more money there that individually hacking a person is, uh, is for most good hackers, it's not worth the time and effort. In the old days, that used to be the way that you'd get it, but now it's so easy to hack the big companies, go after the big company. The third, the third most popular way to uh, get this data is through scams, phishing, and spam attacks. So you get an email, you get a text message, you click on something, you enter in your information, 
And instead of going to your bank, this information is going to a hacker. And then the fourth, uh, I mentioned here, and it's really very rare, uh, it used to be more popular when there were uh, less encryption on public networks and, and uh, things like that. But it's possible, although, like I say, very, very, very rare, that uh, your data is stolen uh, through a Wi-Fi uh, hacking. Okay, once your data is out there, what are the ways that the thieves try and use it? Well, the number one way that thieves use your data is to open fraudulent credit card accounts in your name. So that's usually the easiest way for a thief to, uh, to make money off of the information that they may have gotten uh, in this attack. They uh, also, the second most popular way is the attack. They may have gotten credit card or, or account numbers for banks, and they can use that to directly make a purchase without creating a new credit card. But unless you block down your credit card and things like that, it's easier for them to uh, request a new credit card, have it sent to their address, and all of a sudden your, your bank account is being compromised there. The third way that money is made is uh, the people who do the breaches will sell data on the dark web. So uh, you've probably been out to Amazon or eBay. There's the equivalent of Amazon and eBay buying and selling of data. So anyone can go out there and say, I've got Jim's uh, uh, account and password, and I'm selling it for $5. If you want it, pay me $5. <laughs> And so, so there's the buying and selling there of, uh, of information. A fourth way that you may have heard of is fraudulent taxes, uh, where they either file a tax return in your name or uh, steal your tax uh, refund there. And again, if you have enough personal information or enough information is stolen, it's relatively easy to... Uh, to file and, and do some of these things. And uh, the fifth way is if they know your ID and password, so if it's, let's say, uh, uh, you're, you bank with Wells Fargo and uh, they have now have access to your ID and password for Wells Fargo and you don't have two-factor authentication and some of this other stuff turned on, your account is very vulnerable there. Okay, so we mentioned that this information ends up on the dark web. Let me take a bite. The dark web is not one site at www.darkweb.com. So there is no one, one server there. The internet as a whole is made up of three distinct areas. The first area is called the surface or clear web. Then the second area is the deep. And the third is the dark. The surface or clear, which amounts to 4% of the internet, that can be accessed without a password. So these are servers and services that can be accessed without a password from any browser. And these are the sites that are indexed by search engines like Google and Bing. So when you do a Google search, you're only seeing less than 4% of the internet, uh, which you're seeing the free stuff uh, because if, uh, if the stuff is uh, uh, password protected or locked down, these search engines can't get to the data. The next area is the deep web. This is 90% of the internet. This is the unindexed internet that usually requires a password. Uh, these particular services and, and servers out there are usually not uh, nefarious or illegal or anything like that. They're the sites that you go out to, like your email. When you go to your email, your email is not something that's indexed by Google. Otherwise, everybody in the world could see every email that you've ever got and things like that. Also, it's uh, uh, paid subscriptions that you have, medical records, company private websites. 
3M as a company has hundreds of servers that are used internally for things and are never exposed to uh, outside to uh, uh, people that don't have the proper authentication and passwords to get in. So the dark web is, is that big chunk in the middle there, medical records, legal documents, scientific reports, subscriptions. This is all stuff where it requires an account and a password to get into. The thing that we hear about and, and where that data is bought and sold is the dark web. The dark web is 6% of the internet and is usually used mainly for illegal activities like illegal drugs bought and sold, weaponry, guns, stolen personal data, that's that identity theft stuff, counterfeit, uh, websites and forums which host illegal content like child pornography or white supremacy. So it's usually this illegal activity. A small part of the dark web is used for noble causes. And the noble causes are if I'm a dissident in China and don't want to be tracked and want to pass information, I'm going to do things on the dark web with my friends and people around the world. And the Chinese government is not gonna be able to track me, is not gonna be able to do anything. So there are some good things that can be done on the dark web, but most of it, 99% of the activity on the dark web is for illegal activities there. Uh, the dark web requires specific software. So unless you've loaded specific software, you have never been out to the dark web. Your browser will not get out there. You can't type in www.darkweb and go out there. It, it, it involves specific software, specific configurations, and authorization to access. The dark websites are accessible only through networks such as Thor, which is known as the anonymity network, and I2P, which is for the Invisible Internet Project. And actually, the I2P was created by our federal government, because uh, our federal government does <laughs> want to do stuff without any tracing and things like that, too. So, uh, Again, it, it, it was created for uh, one thing, but has been used uh, for these other uh, purposes. Uh, Thor focuses on providing anonymous access to the internet. I2P specializes in allowing anonymous hosting of websites, identities, and locations of the dark web stay anonymous and cannot be tracked due to the layers of encryption on the system. So this is just a little graphic here. Uh, so this would be a user out here using a Thor client in order to get to a server where they may be exchanging information or let's say it's photographs from China that are illegal that they want to share. They'll put it out on a server and it goes through to get to that. It goes through all these hops. And the reason it goes through all these hops is there's encryption involved. There's anonymity involved. So nothing can be traced back. And if, uh, if it's the Chinese government or the, let's say the police trying to track down somebody who bought illegal weapons, they can never track down who the person was. Uh, so it provides an anonymous way there. Uh, today we're talking about data out there. And uh, so data is bought and sold out on the dark web. And the dark web increases the value of that data by aggregating data with other publicly available data. So let's say there's a data breach of Best Buy. Best Buy data is stolen. Well, Best Buy may be uh, 10 fields that are stolen out of their database for Jim. We'll use Jim again. <laughs> We're going to pick on Jim today. Uh, and uh, so 10 fields are, are stolen there. Well. Uh, those 10 fields may not have included his telephone number and his home address. But if I go to another database, there's another database or another breach that I know Jim's home phone number and I know Jim's home address. If I aggregate that data with the other piece of data, 
I can create a bigger picture of, of Jim, and the more information I have, I can use that to open up new accounts, whether it's a uh, credit card. Uh, I can call into the bank and say, I am Jim, and I want to get into my bank. And what do they do? They give you some challenge questions. Well, again, those challenge questions, if I know those challenge questions, I can get passwords reset and things done there. And uh, an individual's data can cost anywhere from pennies to up to $300 per person there. And these are some examples there. So uh, there's a, there was a breach of W-2 uh, tax statements. Well, taxes have Social Security numbers and more information on. Per each individual, that was costing $8.49. Here's a couple of breaches of, of information. PayPal, you could buy uh, individual PayPal information for $247. Costco, only $5 discount. <laughs> uh, so, so depending on the data that's breached, how valuable that data, how many pieces of information, there's different prices for all of it. And in some cases, uh, uh, let's say like the Minneapolis school system, uh, I could go out there and I could buy all the students' email addresses for probably about $50. If I buy all those email addresses, maybe I'm going to start spamming them and try and get them to buy things or, or things like that. So uh, scammers and, and hackers will buy these lists for not that much money with the hope of uh, using it for another purpose to make money. So the buyers uh, of this info are spammers and credential stuffers who take usernames and passwords leaked from one site, log into accounts on other sites, or create new new accounts and and uh, reset passwords. Let's take a look at a video now. This video, I'm not. We'll see how well the sound plays and and that on here, but. Well, I guess I gotta un Dark web. It is full of guns and drugs and other terrible things. So we had a company look for us on the dark web. What did they find about you? They found data. Data? Yeah, so they found uh, spreadsheets of information, not just me, but lots of people. And it was a variety of information that you can then kind of put together to learn more about individual people. But I should note, it wasn't actually me that they found information about. My, my address popped and there was information about neighbors who had lived in my apartment building. And it wasn't just little bits of information. These were from what are called fulls dumps. So these are like full portfolios of information about people, their names, where they're from, that kind of information. And then you can use that to do all sorts of stuff. In this portfolio of information about you and your neighbors, uh, give me some examples of what's in those little rows and columns inside the spreadsheet of information that we call data. So one particular thing that came out, it was actually uh, information that had been called from a uh, campaign donation database. And so when you donate to a campaign, you, you say um, who you are, sometimes you put um, where you're from, and of course, how much money you, you're willing to give, which is an indication of how much money you have, depending if it's a lot of money. And, uh, and, and then they were able to, of course, match this to the actual address where the people came from. If you have this information, and then maybe, for instance, you have an email address, you could really start to put together uh, a profile of a person to replicate them. And uh, I bring up email because that's where you were vulnerable. Yeah, so it turns out that I was included in uh, a number of different dumps, uh, my email address, as well as my phone number and my UD ID. Now, my UD ID is my phone, my iPhone's unique device identifier. With that information, I was able to plug this into a Google map and see exactly where my phone had been at almost any given moment in time. You were truly much more vulnerable on the dark web than I was, and I'm really happy about that. My random address <laughs> pops up, but that's, I mean, your UDID is everything about you in some ways.
The most terrifying thing about this was that it was in a database of about 12 million records. Okay, so our information was on the dark web, which is uh, not the kind of stuff you can Google uh, for, but on these like uh, these marketplaces that have really cliche, mobby kind of names, Omerita and Black Stuff. But some of this information you can get just by Googling or, or searching people on the surface of the internet, right? Yeah, I in fact found my stuff uh, in addition to having our friends look for us. Uh, I found my stuff on a dark web search engine called Torch, and then it linked back to a clearnet search that I found using DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo is a lot like Google, except it indexes almost everything, including darkweb.onion URLs. So I was able to not only find my information, but verify it on the clearnet. That means that I don't even have to have any special software to find out where you've been. Yeah, hopefully uh, you could hear that. Uh, let's go back here. <clears throat> So the information, as you can see, is out there. And here I uh, say almost everybody's data has been stolen. I would take a guess that there is nobody in this room or online that has not had some of your data involved in a breach. And the reason I say that is there is a site out there, and you can go to It's called Have I Been Pawned. Pawned is a word for have I been compromised. And... Uh, you can go out there to check if you've been involved in a data breach involving your email. Currently, over 12 billion accounts have been breached and are for sale. Well, if you're familiar in the United, I mean, in the world, how many people are there in the world? Eight billion. So, you know, and people do have multiple accounts. I have multiple accounts. I have like six accounts, but 12 billion accounts of some form of information is out there. So let's just take a quick look here. Because you can go out to the site, uh, and what you do is you type in your email address. And it'll, in most cases, it'll say you've been pawned. Your data is out there. Uh, I my uh, this idea has been involved in at least eight known data breaches. It lists the data breaches. It lists the information that's been compromised in those data breaches: address, uh, IP address, names, passwords. Uh, okay, here's LinkedIn uh, email address and password from LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. Uh, email addresses, names, social media profiles, uh, white pages. And then this is giving you a little little information of how much they've indexed to get this information. Or, and this is where that 12 billion number of accounts that have been, uh, been compromised there. So almost everybody's email has been compromised in some way there. Now, don't... <laughs> Don't don't react like this poor guy, uh, and you can see uh, I, I'm still breathing here. Uh, I'm not paranoid. I'm not uh, anxious that my data has been involved uh, in all these uh, breaches and that over the years there. Uh, but what we can do is you can hope for the best that that data will never be used or somebody will never. Uh, uh, connect to your bank account or connect uh, using some of this stuff. But what you all should do is prepare for the worst. Prepare as if somebody has stolen it because the fact of the matter is most of it has been stolen and is available out there. And we'll talk about tips now to protect yourself. So now that I've scared everybody, <laughs> and, and you should be scared. There's good reason to be scared because emails and information is out there and has been compromised. Okay, so the number one, the number two, and the number three thing to protect yourself, and actually I could probably put 
the number one through 100 is create strong passwords that are unique to each of your online accounts, change them re routinely, and never reuse old ones. And this is why I've stressed time and a time again there that you need a password manager to manage this stuff for you, to make it easy to change, to have it documented, because people will go, well, I'm using the same password for these multiple accounts because I otherwise I couldn't remember it and they haven't changed it in five years or 10 years or since they set up the account. You're just, you're, you're gonna have problems, I guarantee it, if you aren't following these rules there. And we did talk about some of this uh, uh, April 2022, online security and passwords. Uh, get more detail on Bitwarden or a password manager. And I recommend Bitwarden, but there, there are hundreds of uh, good password managers out there. I don't recommend using the password managers that come with most of the browsers. So if you use Chrome or you use uh, Microsoft Edge or stuff like that, uh, you've probably seen the prompt after you log into a site and it says, do you want me to remember your account and password? That's not a good password manager. It's better than nothing, but it's not a real password manager. You want a real password manager. Uh, some apps in site uh, also, when you're logging into them, will let you use your Gmail or Facebook account to log in. So if you're setting up a new account, it'll say, uh, do you want to use your email or, or your Facebook uh, account to log into this new uh, business that you're setting up an account for? I don't recommend that. Again, create a new account with a different password. That way, if your main password gets compromised, you're not compromising tens, if not uh, uh, handfuls of other accounts that may be compromised. Uh, also here, I mentioned if you hear a breach, uh, so if you hear of something being hacked, uh, change your password immediately. It can be as little as several days from the time that a breach is done <coughs> to up to 10 years before a hacker or somebody may use that information to try and set up accounts and do things against you. A lot of the accounts, especially uh, banks and that, allow for two-factor authentication, uh, where you can use a secondary form of authentication. It could be a text message uh, sent to your phone or an th authentication app or a physical key that you plug into your computer. There's all kinds of uh, additional authentication that can be put in place for, uh, for things. A stolen password is useless without this additional factor. This is especially important for any financial account, any banking account, any email site. Uh, and the reason I say email is because email is usually uh, the way that most passwords are reset. You'll click and you'll say, reset my password, and what does it do? It sends you that. Well, if the hacker or the person trying to steal your identity has access to your email, guess what? They can change it to whatever they want. Uh, some more tips. Uh, watch your credit card and bank statements for unexpected charges and payments. Uh, most of the banks and credit cards and brokerage will let you turn on notifications so that you can get notified whenever there's a transaction there. Uh, so this is an example. I have a Fidelity credit card. Uh, whenever I make a charge then, I get an email there telling me the amount and, and uh, what was done. So rather than, rather than wait till the end of the month and maybe check a statement and go, I didn't make that charge or I didn't do this, this is a heads up right away immediately as those transactions are taking place. And usually what you can do with those transactions is set limits too. If you only want to see stuff over $50 or, or whatever, you can, you can set that up. There's also uh, free online services like Mint that let you monitor your finances in one place instead of multiple logons or, or things like that. Another thing you can do is you can go paperless uh, where you can. Uh, statements are securely delivered to you and are stored right on your online account. 
then you don't have to worry about somebody uh, stealing your mail uh, before you got to it or stealing your garbage and getting account numbers off of, off of that. If you choose not to, uh, not to create an online account, you are more vulnerable than if you do create an account. So this is what I was talking about earlier. I'll have, uh, I've had this discussion with numerous people who say, I don't trust uh, an online account, so I didn't create one for my bank. Uh, let's say it's Wells Fargo or that. I, don't, I didn't create an online account for Wells Fargo. Well, you're actually more vulnerable than somebody who does create an account and does secure it because it's relatively easy to create an online account with Wells Fargo if I have the account number. Uh, so it's, it's easier to create these new accounts uh, than it is to hack into an existing one. Uh, online services like banks that I mentioned here make it easy to set up new online accounts using limited personal information. And that's why that personal information, what kind of car do you drive, uh, what's your telephone number, uh, where have you lived, those are all things that are on credit reports, and those are all things that uh, get exposed in data breaches and that. Lock up sensitive documents and always shred or use a certified document and uh, destruction service to destroy them. Never give your personal information to somebody who calls you, sends you an email, or texts you uh, if you don't, uh, if you didn't initiate the request. So. This gets back to people clicking on things and uh, not being taken uh, to a, or taken to a hacker site and then collecting information that way from you. And so if you do get a call or somebody <laughs> leaves a message or, or a text and it says they're from the Social Security Administration, don't call back their number. <laughs> Go to the bookmark that you already have or the number or telephone number that you already have for the Social Security and use that and call them and check. Don't respond to clicks or links and text, email, or social media point posts for someone claiming to be from a government agency, a company, or a bank uh, if you didn't initiate it. So they'll try and create some urgency saying your account is going to be locked down or we've noticed suspicious activity on this credit card or on your bank. Call us immediately or we're going to close down your account. Never do that. Another thing you can do is you can request uh, free credit reports once a year. And you can get it from uh, the three different credit services. So within the United States, there's three large companies, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. And these three companies uh, are the credit services who, if a new credit card is created or that, uh, or you need any, uh, any loan information or things like that, everything goes through one of these three companies. And uh, so you can request a free credit report that tells you activity, or if, if new cards have been created, if things, addresses have been changed, if anything has been done there. You can look for unusual activity, uh, such as the appearance of new accounts. Uh, because there's the three companies, and you can do it once a year, you can space out those requests every four months, and you've covered the whole year. Every four months, start out doing Equifax, then four months later, Experian, and then TransUnion, and you can keep a track then if there's any suspicious activity. The other thing that you can do that I highly recommend that people do is freeze your credit, and you can freeze your credit for free to stop anyone from opening up a new credit uh, credit card or requesting loans or services in your name. So again, you notify, uh, you go out to each of these, you have to go out to all three, you can't just go to one, otherwise it just shuts it down at one there. You go out to these three and you can put a credit freeze so that nobody can uh, create a new credit card. And you always have the ability, uh, if you did need to get a credit card or you are going to buy, let's say, a new house. And to buy the new house, the place has to do a credit check on you. In order for them to do a credit uh, 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 deep dive there, they need your account unfrozen. So you can unfreeze your account 
let them create the new credit card or whatever, and then you can freeze it back. So you can freeze and unfreeze as much as you want there. Uh, another thing that you can do, uh, you can sign up for credit monitoring services. Uh, you can pick a credit monitoring service that constantly monitors your credit reports from the three bureaus and alerts you when it detects unusual activity. To help with the monitoring, you can set fraud alerts that notify you if someone is trying to use your identity to create a credit card. Uh, there are services, you may have seen them on TV and stuff like that. Uh, LifeLock is an example, and they have different levels, and that uh, varies from $10 to $30 a month. Or there's even some free ones, Credit Karma is, is this example here. Or what I was talking about, if you're getting those reports from the credit bureaus, you really aren't getting that much more information from, uh, from these services. They just make it a little bit easier for you to uh, be notified then each month. Uh, I personally haven't used Credit Karma. Uh, currently, I am using Equifax, and the reason I'm using Equifax is uh, this goes back, what was it, four years ago? Equifax was breached, uh, and I think it was 200 million accounts. Uh, credit cards were breached. If you were one of the fortunate or unfortunate there, uh, you could get free credit monitoring for three years. Uh, and uh, that's when I signed up for that. Uh, you could also, if you didn't get that, you could get uh, a payment, and the payment was going to be dependent on how many people filed, and so you may have gotten as little as $5. So I thought, well, I'll take the free credit monitoring for three years there. Yes? Tom, is there any significant difference between the three credit monitoring bureaus? If you apply for a new credit card, do they check all three, or do they only go to one of them, or how do they all stay in business? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll repeat it. I should have repeated the last question. Uh, is there differences between the three credit bureaus? And the answer is yes, there is differences. Uh, so it depends on uh, a company like 3M will usually buy a subscription to one of those and use that. Uh, but not all of them are in sync. They do share some information, but obviously each one claims to be the best. Uh, and, and that in there, so you know it, it is what it is. And uh, I've got a cousin I'm I'm currently helping, uh, uh, and um, it was kind of funny. He he had uh, he had a delinquent payment to AT and T. He switched uh, from AT and T cell phone plan to another one and didn't like AT&T, so didn't pay his last bill. Well, uh, that came back to haunt him, <laughs> and, and obviously it got, got reported. The trouble is we were trying to track down uh, uh, for him to pay it. Where, who should he contact there? Well, we went out to Equifax, went out to Equifax, and you put in all this detailed information, and then the screen comes up and says, uh, call this number. I'm going, oh, what's going on here? I called the number there. Uh, Equifax had no information at all about him. Uh, he's, lived, he's lived in his mother's basement for 25 years. He's never had a credit card. He wasn't renting. He, he, was, he was what you'd call flying below the radar there. Wasn't paying any utilities. His mother was paying the utilities. So there was no credit history. They had no no idea. So there's an example of uh, that that delinquent AT and T bill must be on one of the other two. It wasn't in the Equifax system. But they found him in the basement, right? <laughs> to pay that bill. He's no no. I'm actually he had to move out of the basement and and rent an apartment. And when when he went to rent the apartment, that's when they said, "Oh, we see." that you have a delinquent. Here's that bad guy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, some other tips here. Use a mobile-based payment system like Apple Pay or Android Pay. They're more secure than using a physical credit card numbers that might be stolen. And also because of the data breaches, if a company is taking a physical number 
and storing it in their database. Obviously, if their database is breached or that, that's where uh, your number could get exposed. But uh, so you want to minimize where your credit cards are being stored and done. If you use a system like PayPal, so if you're buying on eBay or things like that, uh, PayPal never exposes your credit card number to the actual seller. The seller never sees that credit card, so you have no worry that your credit card is going to get exposed there. Uh, yep. One of the things to watch out with PayPal, I use PayPal all the time for CCTV, right? You can keep your security card, sorry, keep your credit card secure. I have noticed every once in a while I'll get bogus charges that are charged against my PayPal account. So you want to make sure you monitor, look at your statement every so months and look to see if somebody's sending you a bill on PayPal. And if it's real simple to, to, to decline it. You know, just don't say, okay, I'm okay, I'm, and not view the charges. Look, look at your charges every single month. No, and that's, uh, yeah, what, what Chuck had mentioned is uh, make sure and watch your PayPal, and PayPal comes out with monthly statements. If you have an account, it says, here's your monthly statement. Take a look at that. Make sure it only has your charges, because just like a credit card, that uh, there can be fraudulent charges or that, uh, you, you will occasionally see stuff there, and actually it's easier to fraudulently charge stuff on PayPal because... Uh, in the one sense, the account number is the email. Right. Well, the email is involved in, uh, what did we see? 12 billion uh, breaches there. I wouldn't well, they, I, I trust PayPal just from the standpoint that, uh, uh, like, like Chuck said, I'm monitoring my stuff. So if there is any uh, fraudulent charges there, they'll immediately take this stuff off. So they're very good at that uh, and that. And you have to say, what's the alternative then? And the alternative would be, are, are you going to give them a credit card number, this this little store? No. So, I use the U.S. mail and a check with my credit card <laughs> and a stamp. Uh, and I put it in the mailbox. And we yeah. have had problems with it. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say I use PayPal, but I have every act, everything I do pay comes immediately out of my checking account at Wells Fargo. So I get every day I get that. So it's not something that I would find, you know, way down the road. And if you have a credit card, I, I recommend you using the credit card instead of uh out of your bank, it, it because then it's not immediately coming out of your bank, and your credit card you've always got the third kind of the thirty day buffer there. So if you challenge anything, it, it's you're never it's never going to come out of an account or have a problem there. But yeah, to each each their own. Okay, we'll continue on. Uh, virtual private network can help uh, protect your privacy a little bit when you're on a public Wi-Fi. Personally, I don't see a need for uh, for it, um, so I'm not a real fan of VPN, but some people feel more secure using uh, VPN for some of their things there. Be cautious when downloading browser extensions or delete ones that you no longer need. And browser, excuse me, extensions are things like uh, I'll have people that will uh, want the weather, the current weather uh, up in the right-hand corner of their browser, and that's a browser extension. That's a bunch of code that's loaded and running the browser there. Well, a number of these browser extensions uh, over the years, uh, so this is, this is uh, uh, from a year or two ago, eight widely used browser extensions were caught harvesting data from an estimated 4 million customers who used the browsers in Chrome and Firefox. The extensions collected a host of information that wasn't authorized by the browsers, exposing not only complete browsing history, but also files such as tax returns, medical returns, credit card information, and other information. Because once it was attached into the browser, it saw everything that you typed, it knew every website you went out to, it knew everything that you were doing there. And 
uh, hackers are constantly trying to create these new extensions and then get people to load them in and, and use them there. So you do have to be careful. Here I mentioned uh, use a different email addresses for different types of accounts. So you can have multiple emails and uh, use one that you use for your main and one that's kind of a temporary or that. Uh, you can use it to set up new things. And if, uh, if it turns out that you want to use this service or this site, then you could uh, sign up with your real email at a later time. Uh, here I mentioned keep your operating system uh, or OS and, and all of the apps or software up to date and delete old apps that you no longer use. So if you're using old versions of operating systems, and it can be on a Mac, it can be on an iPhone. I know people that say, I don't want to do the update uh, because last time I did the update, I had a problem. Well, the updates are usually to fix a host of security problems. So if you aren't doing updates, you're missing out on uh, fixes to a uh, number of security <laughs> problems. On social media sites like Facebook, uh, use the built-in security to limit what personal information you make public. By default, if you set up a new account in Facebook and make everything public, and you put your address or the year you graduated and your birthday and this is where I went to school, and you're, you're giving all that information away to the 8 billion people in the world. I don't recommend that. <laughs> I put a minimal amount of information out there and I only let my friends uh, access that information. Tom? Yes. One other thing, when you're on Facebook, don't, all the time people are putting out those, you know, where are the places you visited and you know, what was the name of your cat and all that stuff. It's, Little quiz things, don't answer. <laughs> yeah, Chuck's, Chuck's right. A lot of a lot of the little survey deals that you'll see uh, will talk about who is your favorite teacher in high school. Oh, yeah. Well, if if you recall, a number of these security questions that is a question on there, and so they're just trying to harvest that. So or if you believe in genes, just uh, copy and paste it so we know. Yeah. yeah, I don't <laughs> yeah. Know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, another thing here, uh, uh, you, you can buy identity theft insurance. Uh, I don't recommend it uh, simply because um, most of the PayPal's or the banks or things like that will cover almost all your losses there. So having insurance isn't going to give you any more protection there. It's it's a way for these insurance companies in most cases to make money there. So most of the victims don't have any out-of-pocket expenses because you can uh, reverse the charge there. And then in the past we talked about uh, scams and cyber threats uh, in 2022. And then we also had viruses and security. So if you want some more detail on, on some of those in there. Uh, as soon as you suspect your ID has been stolen, you can take action to stop unauthorized charges and start the recovery of your identity. Uh, you can place fraud alerts at each of the three main credit reporting companies. The alerts notify creditors that you've been a victim and let you know to verify the, that you're actually uh, making new credit card requests. Uh, you can place an initial fraud alert, alert which stays on your credit report for 90 days or an extended fraud alert, which stays on your credit report for seven years. Placing a fraud alert does not affect your credit score. You want to contact fraud departments for each of the businesses. So if it was a bank or a credit card, they'll usually route you to their uh, fraud department. Well, they'll do some investigation, and then they'll either give you the thumbs up or the thumbs down there. Uh, while you're not responsible for fraudulent charges, you need to report the suspicious activity promptly. And that's where getting notifications of when your credit card is used or when your bank is uh, making a payment or things like that. The sooner that you see a charge, that it is a fraudulent charge, the uh, better off everybody is there. When you start going down this road to clear things up, document everything by keeping copies of all your documents expenses and records of your conversations about the theft. 
Uh, also, what you can do is the uh, Federal Trade Commission does have a website where you can create a recovery plan. This isn't just for federal, Social Security, uh, identity theft or that. It'll help you. Uh, these are the steps that you should go through. This is what you should do there. Okay, that concludes the regular presentation there. We'll open it up for questions or comments. Yes. How does, uh, how does this app, uh, Telegram, with the streams and meetings and communications, how does that work? Uh, yeah, there's a number, there's a number of uh, packages. Uh, Telegram isn't using the dark. Oh, repeat it. Uh, the question was, how does the app uh, Telegram, which uh, a number of people in the Ukraine are using, uh, how does that work? Well, uh, that is uh, actually using the regular internet. It's not part of the dark web there. It's, uh, but it is using encryption and uh, multiple servers so that stuff can't be traced back. Uh, so in a normal conversation, let's say uh, you were both going to use Skype or, or Zoom or something like that, uh, it, you have an IP address that uh, identifies just you and the person you're talking to has an IP address that identifies just them. And it can be traced back and forth who did what. And if the messages sent back and forth aren't encrypted, that means that anybody listening to the line or sitting in between there can see exactly what you're doing. When you're trying to do uh, things anonymously, uh, that's where encryption and multiple servers and VPNs and hiding identity comes in, where it becomes impossible to trace it from point A to point B there. Okay. And that's what telegraph. Yeah, the there's and there's different ways. You'll actually see some of those capabilities built into a lot of different tools now. Uh, so uh, an example, uh, well, let's let's kind of go back. Uh, let me go back here. Yeah, an example there is uh, if uh, oh no, I lost my train of thought. I was clicking here. Uh, the I mean, there are a number of packages to do things like this. It's being built into things. Uh, if I have my phone and I do a text message and I text message Linda here and send a message to her, that's going over a system which you have to assume that everything is public. Anybody can see that. Uh, people think that I'm just talking with Linda so I, if I wanted to send a password for her or an account number that I have for that, you don't want to send that in a text message. You don't want to send it in an email. You don't want to, you have to understand uh, where, where some of this stuff is considered public. And if somebody, uh, a thief or a hacker or somebody was sitting in between there, would be able to see everything that you're doing there. And so you have to be very careful. Now, now what's happened over time, and, uh, I'll, I'll get back to the question a little bit, what, what's happened over time is, so a company like Apple comes along and says, we wanna make this more secure so our people don't feel hacked. And so what Apple will do is Apple will say, if you're sending a text message from one of our users, Apple users, to another Apple user or iPhone user, we have control of that. It stays within the Apple network. We can protect you. And so they'll protect you. That's the difference when you send a text message and it's all blue. That means you're within the network. Everything is encrypted, safe, and secure. The minute you add an Android user or somebody outside of the Apple environment, all of a sudden, it's no longer encrypted. It's considered public there. So how do you know whether the person you're sending an email to is an Apple user or an Android user? 
Uh, you'll see immediately when you set it up, if you have an iPhone and it'll be blue, the conversation will be blue if, if, you're, if everything's okay there. Yeah. If I send Linda my bank account number today, does the hacker have to see that today or can he find that three weeks from now? Uh, the question was uh, if if I send uh, Linda or anyone my what account inf con account information <laughs> today, uh, is it is it uh, is it is it only out there today, or is it out there for a week, or is it out there for a month? Uh, kind of depends on the mechanism that you use. Uh, each each form of uh, communication uh, may go through multiple servers. Uh, so let's say you were sending messages from within 3M. Well, 3M actually keeps track of all messages that people are sending from their network. So if there becomes an employee problem, they can go back <laughs> and they can, they can identify it. If you don't want to be tracked, don't use the 3M network. <laughs> use your own phone connected to your own data plan. Don't go through the 3M network. Uh, but if I'm doing a telephone call, uh, most telephone calls are not recorded and are not saved. So that's one less thing there. Now, the likelihood that somebody is going to do that, they almost have to be trying to hack you to get that information. So is the average hacker uh, going through and, uh, and attempting to... Uh, to uh, to get into Linda's account or stuff like that? No, but let's say they know that you're, uh, you're the CEO of a cryptocurrency company. They're going to be monitoring that a lot more than somebody who they know may not have that much money because I'm not going to spend a lot of time and money monitoring where there's not a big payback there. Uh, so I may put my time and effort to something that'll pay pay back more money there. Uh, first we'll take, yep. Yeah, the security, the question was uh, some of the banks, or the comment was some of the banks and some places will have passcodes or another form of authentication. And that's where the two-factor authentication, whether it's a, a, a code that you've set up beforehand, uh, some financial institutions will do it by your voice. So you go in and register your voice and it will not let you in or make a change there. And those, uh, the systems are getting more sophisticated to try and block some of these things because uh, the systems that we use nowadays, just like we were talking about with the text messages, well, actually, there's nothing really secure about the text messages. So, uh, and... The passcodes, I'm sure they could be hacked through, you know, but it's just another... Right. It's, it's, it's another form, and that's why... It's, it's kind of a combination of all these things. When you're looking to protect yourself, it's not just one thing. Certainly the passwords, uh, certainly the two-factor authentication, certainly the monitoring of, of accounts and that, because if you don't look at some of this stuff, uh, you are opening yourself up to uh, bad things happening there.
wouldn't say it, it's exactly as you see in this survey, but it does go through um, apples and other types of information. Yeah, so the, the member was saying. Um, text messages, anything you do on your phone, like if you use Safari in that as a browser, it goes through the right relay in that. So they don't call it a VPN, but it's. It's, it's Apple's version of a VPN yeah. is really what it is. A VPN is a, is a public, uh, uh, public way to communicate to, uh, through tunneling to protect stuff. Uh, private Relay is Apple's, Apple's version of VPN to protect privacy. Where do you find it? So if, if you study? want to, after the meeting, I don't mean to hijack things here, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so after the meeting, if you want to know where it is and how to enable it, I can, I can help show you where it is. Yeah, and, and actually if you, if you Google it or go out to the Apple website yeah. and search for it, it'll tell you too. And, yep. and the limitations there would be uh, you're talking to another person with an Apple device and yeah, things like one, that. One thing you have to do to enable it, and that is you have to, they have, first 50 megs saved, and that is free for data, and you have to pay a dollar a month for uh, the additional data added to the new Safari data set. I think that's an It's an additional You had a question, Linda? During the course of this, <clears throat> you made a comment that caught my attention that leaves me understanding that uh, right now, for example, I have a situation where one of the services I have wants me to stop, wants to go to paperless mail. And so did I hear you say that if we're going to provide an account for them to extract money, you know, for some just money, whatever it's going to go on, it should not be from our bank accounts. It should be from our credit cards, right? Credit so cards, by their nature, are usually easier to uh, identify fraud and stop mm -hmm. fraud. So if you have yeah, a if you have a bank over. account, let's say you had a bank account and you only had a uh, hundred dollars in that bank account, uh, a thief could go in there and take all that money out. Uh, for you to clear that up, it may take you several days, it may take you a week, it may take you a month to get that money back in your bank account. In the meantime, all of your bills could be, could be uh, uh, overcharge, overcharge, or insufficient funds. Uh, you know, this all kind of started, though, with transitions of 3M's help with us getting our health care services. Yeah, it, 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 and they said, you know, just set this up in your bank account. And I never really even questioned it at the time to any great extent because I thought, okay, we're dealing with this entity. And I I did, a number of the places won't let you put in a credit card because the credit card costs the company money to oh, process. So, so not every that. place lets you do a credit card. But if you're using, this is where you have to kind of understand what your options are and try and make it as safe and, and those secure are as possible. Well. two of the primary options of your credit card or your bank account, I suppose. Uh, it, it, nowadays, you can use okay, almost yeah. any financial institution and stuff like that and do wire transfers and things like that, which, uh, but yeah, there's different ways to do things there. Yes. And Tom, you mentioned about Fidelity credit card where you can charge something on there, you get a text message saying, you know, I have that set up too with my credit cards. Some of them come right away. Like American Express, I can be at Byerly's and buy something, and as soon as I charge it on that card, my phone dings. Other credit cards, it comes a day later. A lot can happen in a day. Yeah, the question was uh, some of the, uh, when you charge and have alerts or notifications set up, some credit cards are almost immediately, others take time. Uh, and 
there's there's kind of two situations there. Uh, uh, some of it is customizable by you. Uh, uh, Fidelity, as an example, does not send them out immediately. It just sends it out once a night, which if you have a number of charges is better than getting dinged all, to, all the times during the day. You just get one at night saying you had this charge, this charge, this charge, all in one note. Uh, so uh, some of it can be consolidated that way. Uh, but certainly if you want something that is more rapid right away there, uh, then uh, look at the credit card, ask them how often they send notifications out because you can find other providers there. Uh, I, I have my dad's uh, uh, Chase account, Chase credit card. Those happen immediately. I'll, I just went to Aldi's and bought something and five minutes later, bing, you know, it's up. Now, some places, uh, another example is I just had dinner at a place and that took a week to show up. And that's because they go through a third par party to process and then that third party, you know, by the time it gets uh, on the books back to my credit card, it take it took that long. The so other thing, the other thing too is uh, when you go into a credit card, you can your account and then under alerts, yeah. and that you can set the alert and that will change the alert to be notified sooner or later. In some cases, not in all in cases. In some, yeah. And that, but I, I recently did that with um, with my capital card for Mark, and, uh, and uh, now I just you know there's a, there was an alert in there where they had to be notified. Okay, I see Jim on here had asked, uh, what about home title monitoring? Is it worth it? Uh, home title monitoring, I would say, is yeah. not worth it there. Uh, it's uh, certainly there are some scams out there where people will uh, attempt to take over your uh, deed and your house. Uh, that's a lot harder to do and uh, uh, usually is uh, only uh, uh, being able to be accomplished if you're kind of a, a property that you bought that you aren't really monitoring uh, and so somebody else may may take over that property. But in general, uh, titling, uh, you don't have to worry about it. it. It's a lot harder to steal. Nowadays, it's so easy to steal this other stuff. Yes? And I will say, sending a check is not safe either. I, I would do the same thing, not get the credit card because they couldn't keep recharging it. So I got the Arizona Republic newspaper and it had the one month or two month special. I thought, just give them a check so they can't charge after that. They don't want it for two months. Once they had your check, they have your ACH number for your bank. They charge my bank. No. And trying to get it back, I went, you know, to someone in the Philippines, and I said, I never could get it back. I, so, so checks are not safe either. Yeah. So the the comment the comment was that checks aren't aren't safe, and and that's absolutely true because if you have the routing number uh, and your account number. Uh, I can I can yeah. do it uh, now the banks like I say you you can get it reversed but it may take a week or a month uh, and uh, uh, so it's uh, it, it can be messy there I won't even write a check for like a funeral uh, to put in a, a card because the next thing I know I am trying to tell doctors without borders that uh, I have another different charity that I want to get to. So it's kind of like whatever that happens to that check, if they give it to whatever, United Way or whatever, uh, pretty soon I'm on their list. So now they just get... You know, you, you can also do a donor advisory card. Yeah. No, no, no. But then yeah. uh, the well, bank sends it out. You don't send it out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, and what That's what you're seeing and uh, so... so yeah. Account numbers, whether it's checking or or credit cards, you usually don't want that. And what you're what you're starting to see more of too, even in the credit cards, is one-time use numbers. Uh, so uh, instead of your credit card number there, it's a one-time use, which means that uh, it's only good for one transaction. 
and that's usually going to be your transaction that you just did. If, if the company passes it along or somebody else saw that number and attempted to use it, it's going to say that account is closed. They can't do anything on it. So there are there is this concept of the one-time use uh, uh, deal, but otherwise your standard bank account, your standard credit card is using using that. Okay, any other questions? We're getting That's towards the end here. Do you know Thank any you. credit card companies that use this uh, one-time use thing? Uh, there's a, I personally don't use <laughs> it, uh, but I, I don't know, do other people? I, I, I've seen it, I've seen it listed there, and usually what you do is, uh, uh, in order to buy something, I'd have to use the app on my phone, or go out to the go out to the website. Credit alert! <laughs> I'd, I'd have to go out to the website, and then it would issue issue me a one time use number because it it is a unique number that is only available for one one uh, uh, charge there. What if they get all these six two digit numbers? Are they ever going to run out? I, well, you know, if you if they start using alpha, which technically they could start using alpha in there, then you uh, bump up the number uh, exponentially there. Okay, well, thanks uh, for coming, and uh, thank Paula for the sandwiches. And